February was an interesting reading month. I found a new favorite book, which I will be talking to everyone about all the time. I read from four different countries since my TBR theme this month was books around the world. And of course, during interesting times, there's always a little bit of disappointment as well. I have a lot of thoughts about this month's books, so let's update my reading journal. It had stopped raining. That's how This Is Happiness by Niall William opens. But I think the real introduction to this book comes about 13 pages later, when it reads, I sometimes think that the worst thing a young person can feel is when you can find no answer to the question of what you're supposed to do with this life you've been given. At moments, you're aware of it, balanced on your tongue, but not what comes next. Something like that. I can now say that another version of that happens in old age, when it occurs to you that since you've lived this long, you must have learned something. So you open your eyes before dawn and think, what is it that I've learned? What is it that I want to say? This passage really perfectly introduces to us to our narrator, um, because the best way I have to generally describe the feeling of reading this book is for you to imagine sitting on a porch uh, somewhere in the countryside. It's slightly overcast and maybe there's a light drizzle. You're under a cozy blanket on a rocking chair drinking coffee or tea and a 67-year-old man is sitting next to you telling you stories about his life about growing up in a tiny village in Ireland and how it experienced the arrival of electricity, stories about the first time he fell in love, about his struggle with faith, but in a boyish way, about his first time getting drunk, and all of that sprinkled with some grandfather wisdom here and there. I absolutely love this book. I think the writing is possibly the best writing I've ever read. Even though it was very slow paced, which I usually don't really enjoy, there were so many of these paragraphs that I could read over and over again that I am just so in love with this book. Um, the author has such a beautiful way of describing everything from the setting to the characters to feelings and above all just the mundane things in life. As he is introducing himself, he also introduces Faha, a small parish in Ireland, and at some point he does so by the way of smells, and he lists a bunch of stuff like bread and coal, and then he gets into rain. The smell of rain in all its iterations, the smell of distant rain, of being about to rain, of recent rain, of long ago rain, the insipid smell of drizzle, the sweet one of a downpour. And I've just never looked at rain the same since. I know it's a common thing to, do, to refer to the smell of rain, but never in this elaborate and specific way. And I thought it was just beautiful. When he's describing this village or events, I also love how he would talk about them and then go, because this was 60 years ago, some details are imagined. And it just gives that extra layer of authenticity. Uh, after an introduction to the setting and to him, the storyline really starts and these beautiful descriptions continue. I'll share uh, one more of my favorite passage. Um, there's a part of the book where he talks about his first crush and he says, I thought of her. And then in between brackets, he writes, To say thought is a lie. It supposes a vacancy and then a conscious act. But she was there before I was aware of the words to think or say she was. To say thought suggests a singular act, I thought of her, but the truth was she was universal and not singular. That is, she was all my thoughts and at the same time, so that they were not separate, not measured or measurable, not individual, like memories. Not how her hand felt at the back of my neck, not the smell of soap on her fingers or the scent of her hair, not the crinkle sound of the fabric of her blue dress, not the firm resound of her shoes on the oak floor, not the dark line of her lowered and grave eyebrows, the kindness of her voice, but all of these, and more, and all somehow already inside of me fluttering and spinning and hopelessly rendered 
by the poor phrase, I thought of her. I don't gush over books that quickly, but I am seriously gushing over this book as I am rereading these passages. I also love the way he would describe characters sometimes. For example, he had the raw look of a trainee saint in the glossy eyes of those in combat with their own blood, or she whirled around the kitchen with the briskness of those butterflies that must condense a lifetime into a few days. It gives you so much insight in such a specific way to who these characters are as a person in life and their behavior even. The author just has an amazing skill at describing the mundane, not only in a beautiful but also in a funny, pointed and relatable way. I never thought that I would relate to anything in a book about a boy living in 1950s Ireland on the brink of electricity, but I did on many occasions, whether just about things of being human or um, daily things in life where you'll see that actually not that much has changed. I think this author has a talent of describing every moment in anyone's life in a lyrical and beautiful way. And it was proven by a passage about the narrator getting drunk for the first time and then it was proven again when I read about half a page about a boy chewing bread and that was still enjoyable and brilliant even. I already know this book will be one of my favorites this year, if not my number one. So I would highly, highly recommend it to anyone who is into beautiful prose. It is slow paced, but I didn't mind it that much. It also gives some insight into Irish culture and their relation with religion and how life in these small parishes were, which is also really enjoyable. So a shout out to my lovely Irish friend who recommended me this book. I am forever grateful. Highly, highly recommend reading this one. Next, I read Celestial Bodies by Jocka L. Hearthy, translated by Marilyn Booth. This is an intergenerational story set in Oman, mainly following three sisters and their marriage journeys. While I love the idea of this book and I love intergenerational stories, this one left me with mixed feelings. It was interesting to learn more about modern history of Oman, which I knew very little about. I learned some interesting things about the end of slavery in Oman and how that played into social life, and also the focus on family struggles and the concept and perceptions of marriage were very intriguing, but ultimately the story felt a little bit underwhelming. And I think it's because of a combination of a few things. In terms of structure, it alternates between the third-person view and the first-person narration of Abdallah, the husband of Maya, who is one of the three sisters. And we hear his story of his father's cruelty in his youth, in his mother's mysterious death. But the book doesn't just tell his story, it tells the story of a lot of people, um, which is why you really need that family tree uh, that is at the start of this book. And even with it, I was confused a lot of the time about the relationship between the characters, who is who, whose storylines were overlapping. This book is a little under 250 pages long, and I just don't think that it did all the storylines justice because there was so little time to get to know all these characters. Maybe some people are more determined, but I feel like I kind of gave up on figuring out who some of these characters were. I got a little tired of looking at this rather complex set of family trees and I just kind of read on at some point, which definitely didn't improve my enjoyment of this book. Um, so this is partially on me. I just wish the overall story had focused on a lot less stories in it. I was also not a huge fan of the writing. It felt a little stiff in the third person part and a little all over the place during the first person narration. And it just left me a little detached from the characters in the story. I think a combination of not enjoying the writing style and having to flip back through the family trees just left me 
yeah, very unattached to the characters and the stories and I wasn't moved despite the topics and emotions that should have been conveyed. It's kind of strange thinking back about this book. It's like in theory, I liked it or should have liked it. Uh, but in practice, I kind of had to struggle through it. So I don't know if I should recommend this book to you or not. I think for the topics covered, yes. But then for the book as a whole, I'm not so sure. Um, so yeah, mixed feelings about this book. Maybe time will give me some more clarity on how I felt about this one. I also read I Want to Die But I Want to Eat Topoki by Bek Sehi, translated by Anton He. The first chapter of this book is called Slightly Depressed and opens with classic signs such as hearing voices, intrusive thoughts and self-harming aren't the only signs of depression. It's the start of an intimate therapy memoir where the author documents and reflects on her 12 weeks in therapy. A lot of it is actual transcriptions of her therapy sessions with some short reflections in between and then in the later part of the book she reflects on different themes like love, solitude, but also just important people, pets and things in her life. I definitely sped through the book. It's a very quick read despite the very hard and often uncomfortable topics that were discussed. I think reading actual transcripts definitely makes it a very approachable way to read about the author's thoughts. I I think it's also an incredibly vulnerable and honest way to do this and I think my favorite thing about this book is also the re reason that the author gives for writing it and that's that if just one person can feel seen and heard about their daily struggles by reading this and know that they're not alone, I think that's already incredibly powerful. I wouldn't say that I related that much to this book myself, but having struggled with a lot of anxiety in the past, I can definitely recognize certain behaviors and thoughts she talks about. Despite these things being very individual and different for everyone, uh, who goes through the, this, I think there is a level of similarity in the way we experience our brain, if that makes sense. And I think again this shows the strength of this book because even if you're not struggling with the exact same things as in the book, reading about someone else's felt reassuring that it's okay, we're all a work in progress and we all struggle with something and I think this book does a really good job at making you feel okay with that. I think it also does a very good job at understanding better that sometimes people behave a certain way because of their mental health and think that things like anxiety and low self-esteem and depression or other things can kind of take over and make you behave in a way that you actually don't like yourself or don't want to behave like. And I hope that people both with and without mental health issues get to read this because it's such a good reminder that people are all going through their own struggles and we should all give each other and ourselves some grace. I think it's extremely brave for this author to have been so open and I hope we can all be a bit more open and vulnerable to each other um, in order to find strength and support in each other and to work towards a version of ourselves that we are happier with for ourselves and that I think that ultimately brings us all closer together too. So it's not necessarily a new favorite book or anything, but I would recommend this book to anyone who is open to reading about mental health. If you are struggling yourself, do take care if maybe you don't want to read about these topics at the moment. I found it very hard to rate this book, so I didn't. There is something um, about giving a star rating to someone sharing their experience so openly that felt wrong, um, but I would recommend reading it. I want to finish this part of the review with a passage in one of the reflection parts of the book where the author writes, meeting someone who moves your heart, writing something until it moves the hearts of others, listening to music and watching movies that depict love. I want to always be motivated by love. 
If pure rationality keeps forcing itself into the spaces in between, I shall lose the shine and comfort of my life, which is why I want to be an emotionally bright person, even if it means becoming impoverished in terms of rationality. I want to hold hands in march with those who feel similarly to me. It's difficult to say whether sense or sensibility is the superior of the two, but they definitely have different textures. And the texture I enjoy more of is, of the two is definitely one of love and sensibility. And while I don't think rationality and sensibility are mutually exclusive, and I also don't think the author means that here, I did feel really connected to this sentiment, especially lately I've definitely been giving sensibility and love the upper hand over rationality and it's been giving me so much joy. I was definitely raised on a pure rationality diet and it's taken years for me to figure out how actually myself as a person wants to balance sense and sensibility. And that is something I really hope for people to find that right balance between, for themselves between um, sense and sensibility because I think that if you find that sweet spot for yourself, it gives your life direction in the warmest and most comforting way. Finally, I also read Ghosts by Dolly Alderton. On the day I was born, 3rd of August, 1986, The Edge of Heaven by Wham was number one. That's how our main character, Nina Dean, is introduced. Her friend group is one classically portrayed as early 30s friend groups. All of her friends are getting married, having babies, moving to the suburbs, except for this one eccentric single friend. After enjoying her single life, Nina eventually ventures into the dating apps and meets this guy called Max. What follows is a bit of a, in my opinion, dated rom-com story mixed with the emotional story of her dealing with her father's starting dementia and her mom's kind of midlife crisis. Ghosts has a large theme of ghosting which back in 2020 when this was published was maybe a new and interesting topic but now felt a bit dated and just frustrating to read. While there are fun parts and her writing is witty as usual, it in general has a very depressing look on dating in your late 20s and early 30s, which is a very different take than in her memoir, Everything I Know About Love, which I enjoyed a lot more. Um, the writing is great still and I picked up this book because I enjoy the author's writing but I it didn't outweigh the plot and the general negative vibe that I was getting from this book. It also bordered on a little bit of man-hating at times and it just didn't resonate with me. I finished it because it was an easy book to read and I have a difficult time not finishing a book because I always want to know how it ends but I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. I rated it three stars, it was okay. I would however recommend her memoir, Everything I Know About Love and I have also heard a lot of praise about her most recent book, Good Material, which I may read because I do really love her writing style and I want to end with some quotes to demonstrate this because what I particularly like uh, about Dolly Alderton is how she combines funny and witty parts um, like for example here where she is describing texting on dating apps there was a minimum of three hours delay in response three days was more common but the anticipation was never rewarded with quality of content Sorry, been insane at work. Food writing, that's cool. I work in property. Was all the long silence afforded. But then she goes into these beautiful passages describing the love of Picasso for his muse. What would it be like, I wondered, to be seen through such adoring eyes that they could not only capture you in a painting, but rearrange you to further exhibit who you were? I stroked the rounded right angle where my neck met my shoulder, like it was the hand of a lover and thought about being put inside a Rubik's Cube of someone's gaze. I couldn't imagine ever being studied and known like that. 
I mean, it's gorgeous, and I I love that those two passages, while extremely different, come together so naturally in her book. And that's why I'm definitely not writing off Dolly Alderton as an author after this one book. It just wasn't my thing, but we'll definitely read her other and upcoming work still. So those were the four books I read in February. Let me know in the comments what you have been reading. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please like and subscribe if you did. That would really help my channel grow. And thank you so much for watching and have a nice day.